Hello, so this is a joint presentation because it's kind of a joint experience we made together. Um, so let's start how we began with all of that. Uh, a year ago in Atlanta, I gave a talk about how ready is the global DNS for IPv6. Now this was from a resolver perspective, uh, not from uh, the, the actual clients. So I want to make uh, uh, research how reachable a v6-only server would, uh, what, what, a, what domains a v6-only server could reach. And we discovered that the main problem was the missing glue at the parent, because if you are kind of iterating uh, from the root and you're not getting the IPv6 glue, the IPv6 resolver really cannot do anything. So let me show you a slide from that talk. So um, as you see, the top domain that is IPv4 only was akadns.net, <laughs> the domain that sort of we own. <laughs> that was very embarrassing, but I mean, it doesn't help. I mean, the data is the data, <laughs> and then the truth is in there. So as you see, uh, it was bad, so I kind of got back home and tried within the company to, okay, maybe we should do something about it, and I got people engaged, and we actually did something about it. So let's make this better, and this is what we did, and this all looks good now, or? <laughs> Anybody seeing a problem? Thank you for your talk. <laughs> okay, and then I get a call from Duane. <laughs> Just the green. All right. So at, at Verisign, we were getting ready to do uh, an algorithm rollover for for .NET, and we're looking at our data, and we all of a sudden we saw these big spikes. The um, to the purple line there um, that represents total query volume for for .NET, and it normally sits at about half a million queries per second. And then we saw these spikes that essentially doubled the amount of traffic and they lasted for many, many hours. <clears throat> and, and so they would come and go and, and uh, on, the, on this graph, the bottom line is uh, a subset of, of total queries that are truncated. So we're getting these huge spikes where all the responses are, are truncated. Um, and it, and it, it turned out that they were for, for, <laughs> for the Akamai domains. The Akamai had changed I think maybe four or so domains, their delegations had, had increased the glue. And so what we, what we learned is that um, all these, this, these spikes, all this traffic was coming from really a single ISP um, from a resolver uh, in, in or an ISP in Europe. Um, we were seeing TCP SYN packets from these sources, but not the third part, not, not the final SYN ACK. Um, outside of those spike events, we were observing occasional successful TCP track transactions from these uh, same sources, and we also saw other resolvers exhibiting this UDP retry behavior, but not, not at that scale, you know, much lesser extent. <clears throat> so both Verisign and Akamai tried to, you know, outreach to this ISP and sort of understand what was going on. Uh, eventually, I think via Akamai channels, we learned that they were using Linux, IS, uh, Linux IP tables with connection tracking and those, the, the state tables sometimes became full, and when that happened, they were permitting outbound uh, TCP but not inbound TCP, and, and again, when, 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 when those state tables filled up, then their resolvers were very aggressively retrying over UDP. We don't really know what, what triggered or resolved the condition, but uh, we, you know, we could very clearly reserve, uh, observe it. So the way that we got here was, um, you know, we have this ISP that, that can't do DNS over TCP, uh, at, at VeriSign, we have this pretty strict uh, glue truncation policy following the recently published RFC, which says, you know, if not all in-domain uh, glue records fit, you have to truncate. And then we have Akamai's domains with large delegation responses. And, and, and really, any one party here could, could solve this. <clears throat> uh, at VeriSign, we did an experiment where we, on, on one of our sites, we reverted to our previous glue truncation policy, which was much more liberal, you know, put as much as you can in, uh, but, but, in but don't necessarily truncate. Um, and this graph shows the results of that. The, the, the axis here is only a few time span of a few seconds. And the, the vertical line shows the first time we re returned a response uh, with, this, with the, the different policy. Um, it it kind of looks like the, the traffic goes up right at that time, but that's just an artifact of this data that being sort of noisy and, and um, spiky. But, but within a few seconds, the, the, the total traffic from, from that ISP um, dropped to zero, essentially, because it got, it got a response that it could finally use. <clears throat> um, shortly after that, uh, Akamai changed their delegation 
so that the responses were smaller. And again, we were able to observe that change. Uh, this graph shows resolvers that are, are doing a lot more UDP truncation than we would expect. And when they made that change, again, the, 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 the effect was, was almost immediate. Um, so back to you, Ralph. <clears throat> Okay, so during that time, I've, uh, when I looked into researching that, I said, well, um, after we discovered with that ISP that it was truncation, why not do a quick experiment while this sort of, uh, the event is ongoing? I mean, because it was a couple of days uh, before we actually got it all in a good state again. So I've made a simple experiment without any uh, code or something. It was really just dig and some shell scripting. So. Uh, I want to know what happens if a resolver can no longer use TCP as a transport mechanism, and what would happen in the cold cache and what would happen in the hot cache scenario? Because that's, I mean, most of the, the queries are answered out of hot cache, so uh, usually around 95%, so that's the more important case, but I still want to know what actually would be used in TCP and UDP to actually get to that query. So the idea was to do one dot 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 akamai.com, one apple.com, and then repeat that after 60 seconds, because we have this 20 second TTL, so I want to make sure that at least some stuff goes out and, and asks, so I don't have the fully cached scenario. And, uh, well, one time with a normal resolver, and one time with one where I artificially uh, blocked outbound TCP. I mean, that's the same behavior that, it's not the same, but a similar behavior. So with uh, the regular resolver, the initial akamai.com required 106 packets, four TCP session that made 50, 44 packets because we had this large responses, so we had to go out and, and get them. And then the uh, apple.com afterwards, we didn't need to, need to go out because the akamai edge CDN domains already were kind of uh, within the cache, and the apple used 22 packets, and then a hot cache. Uh, with the exception of the actual uh, CDN uh, target was 12 packets and then apple.com was eight packets. So that's, I mean, fairly standard, nothing to worry about. Now, if I switch off TCP, the result is like that. So in the, in the cold cache, I mean, sure, it is more packets, but it doesn't look that bad because it's, I mean, four times. Uh, and then, well, you try a lot of TCP because all the servers are not reachable over TCP. And in the Apple come, I mean, some stuff gets somehow answered, but not all. So you have 70 UDP and 32. But the real thing is the hot cache, because keep in mind, hot cache is the regular, the default. That, so you see much more queries for hot cache than you see for cold cache. And that was kind of going from 12 to 384 packets, and half of it again was TCP attempts, and 64 and 32. So that explains why this is really uh, getting to the uh, size of the event that uh, uh, Duane observed, because it's nearly, uh, um, well, it's 10 times when it's uh, not available. But the, the, hot, the hot cache, I think, is really, you get a surf fail. And the surf fail is also the worst signal you can get in, in uh, DNS because it means, yeah, something's wrong. I don't know why. Try again, maybe. And that means the usual retry time. I mean, we have TTLs and negative TTLs. But for surf failure, yeah, we do cache some of that. But it's usually in a matter of some seconds or so. So it's not huge. And that means that. The clients were still trying to go there, so you get inbound queries a lot, but, uh, and you can amplify the outbounds, but it, you're not getting, any, getting anywhere. So I think the conclusion is, and I've been saying that a long time, anything DNS, don't do stateful. Don't do, I mean, don't do firewalling. I mean, if you have to do firewall, do packet filtering without state, because it is kind of like, the nature of, of, of DNS is that it's lots of small stuff, and the usual firewalls and all that sizing is done for, well, HDP, large re re responses, stuff uh, like that. So don't, don't try to do anything stateful. And uh, uh, if you do, I mean, stuff might, might go wrong. And if you do, try, really have to do stateful and monitor it properly. So with that, 
back to. Yeah, so I, I guess this is my slide. Um, so, um, like I said, RFC 9471, which uh, I had the pleasure of, of being a co-author on, <laughs> uh, kind of, you know, came back to bite us a little bit. Um, so a, a question for, you know, the audience is, uh, did, did we get that right? You know, it's, right now it's pretty strict, and uh, maybe there should be some exceptions so that authoritative servers can protect themselves from aggressive or broken resolvers, or perhaps there should be something like a, 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 re, a response rate limiting uh, policy uh, feature where you can you can change uh, you you can change your truncation policy if you exceed RRL limits uh, something like that just just an idea to throw out there um, I believe that is our last slide right yeah. okay yeah so we have time for questions <clears throat> hi my name is Ben Schwartz I'm an engineer at Meta I wanted to first understand when you send that truncated response do you still include a bunch of glue records along with the TC bit? Um, no. Okay. Right? There's David. Yeah, no. <laughs> I'm checking, checking my expert in the audience. Yeah, we do not. It's, it's, there's no, um, no glue records. It's just truncated. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I haven't read 9471 recently, if at all. Uh, and I, but I was under the impression that you at least would be, it would be permissible for, for the authoritative server to include essentially as much glue as fits along with the, the TC bit. Uh, and I wonder if that would have done a lot better for you. Uh, certainly it could have under certain resolver heuristics uh, saying something like, well, I, you know, I got some glue, uh, let's try to use it maybe in parallel with uh, the TCP follow-up or uh, maybe if the TCP follow-up fails. Hi, uh, Puneet Sood from Google Public DNS. So, couple of observations. I think the RFC talks about sibling glue there. That's one thing where I think we can be more clearer and sibling glue sh probably shouldn't require uh, the glue to be present or truncation. That may help with some cases. And I believe looking at, we had, a, as I had posted on the operations list earlier, we had a related interesting incident about a month back. Uh, and the, I think the takeaway, at least for us, is that root and TLDs are special, just because they're that important. So maybe what we want to look at is if we want to specialize some of the behavior there. I don't know exactly what the right thing is, but they're special enough that we might need to do that. And for everything else, truncate and please use TCP. The one other thing I'll add is beyond a certain point, as also Shane's presentation pointed out, is that having too many IPs or name server names doesn't really help. Uh, you can do the math beyond like I think four or five unique names, it doesn't help. It just adds to the state and the message sizes. So for people who are adding 15, 20 names, please look at it. It's probably not necessary. It's historically, I mean, that the Akamai uh, domains, all that 13 <laughs> things, uh, we've, we've counted back. I think currently we are trying to fit them in reasonable size. We still have a lot because we are using more DNS direction than we are using any cast for, for actually kind of directing traffic. So there are still some, but we've gotten better, I think. Jeff Houston, APNIC. The issue around being unable to resolve using TCP, we've known about for over 15 years, I think. I gave a presentation, I think, at OARC back in 2013 that pointed out around 7% of all clients on the internet at the time could not resolve a name if the only way to do so was via TCP. They were just left. But the other corollary of that, which is what you're seeing now, is thrashing. So there's this twofold problem that a small number of resolvers, and they're not the big open ones, they're resolvers in ISP closets, you know, just for whatever reason cannot initiate TCP, but then the resolver protocol behaviour tends to thrash. My suspicion is that the more name server IP records that you've got given, 
you'll thrash more intensely because you time out, you can't resolve it, so you do it twice, you do it four times, and it becomes an exponential problem. So how do you get around this without kind of sinking the authoritative server? And in some ways, the real issue is the balked behaviour down there at the recursive resolver. And without changing that, and we've known for a long, long time they are very resistant to change, the only response is to regard it basically as a rate-limiting response up at the authoritative server. Because it's, you are being subjected to basically an attack by balked software being very aggressive on retries. My suspicion, though I've never really tested it, is if you reduced the number of name server alternatives, when you can't do TCP, how badly do you thrash? But you've still got the cycle of ask, wait, ask. Much more records means you can ask more and wait for an answer. If you had fewer, my suspicion is you wouldn't be thrashing as much, but I've never really tested that scenario myself. But the proportion of folk who can't do TCP, my suspicion is, although I haven't counted it in the last few years, that 7% of users who sit behind non-TCP capable recursives hasn't changed one iota. But the RFC says you must. Oh, okay, well, fine. I think, <laughs> Jeff, there is a difference. The server regularly was able to do TCP. It just kind of flipped to the state where it couldn't when the uh, state table overflew. So it could do TCP normally, but not in that case where we kind of gave it lots of TCP. Right, but you're talking one instance. I, I was doing a much larger experiment that said if you had to rely on TCP over the entire internet, how many users would not get the answer no matter how hard they thrashed? And the answer is disappointingly large. <laughs> you know, and that's, I think, part of this message about truncation will get us out of this mess. Um, unlikely in, in the visible future. That's all. Thanks. Sure, thanks. Um, less a question than a comment. This is a really good illustration of two principles we like to talk about a lot, but we hardly ever see really good examples. First, this is a complicated set of failures. You know, there were a number of, you know, multiple players, all doing things that made sense. Nobody did anything wrong, but something bad still happened. Um, and the other thing is, you know, even for the biggest of the big, you know, you have to work together. Nobody gets to be the internet by themselves. And because we spend so much time trying to explain those principles to less technical people, would it be possible in your abundant spare time to consider a write-up of this for a less technical audience? Happy to consider, yeah. I'm happy to send text. 